Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. I like talking to him every three or four months, get his input on all the constant changing with governments and central banks, all these crazy policies. He is the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report newsletter, Dr. Mark Faber. Thank you for joining me again. Well, thank you very much for having me on uh, January. What is it now? The third or the second <laughs> in well, my well, in my region in Asia, it's already the third. Yes, it's Monday, January second, twenty twenty three. Want to get your thoughts on once the Fed stops hiking rates? Do you think then that the bear market in stocks and other asset uh, classes will stop pretty soon after the Fed stops hiking interest rates? Well, this is a good question, and it will depend on the position of the market before uh, the Fed stops hiking rates. Uh, first of all, we will not know precisely whether they will stop or not, but an indication would be that uh, the economy is very weak, and uh, then uh, the Fed will probably listen to some of its uh, large donors and influential people, in other words, people with large assets. Uh, once these people with large assets would be down by 50% from the, the highs of their wells, they will become somewhat concerned. And so they will tell the Fed, well, you better do something, you know, better take some inflation uh, rather than have a massive recession and uh, collapsing earnings. But it, it's a it's a question, you know, we will need to no longer analyze uh, e economic statistics, most of which are published by the government that cheats anyway and lies and de deceives people into believing that everything is good when uh, the largest uh, segment of the population, the less affluent members, the middle class and lower classes, they've been in recession already for uh, three or four years. Because if your wages go up by, say, 5%, and the rate of inflation is 9% or 8%, then in real terms, your income is going down by four or three percent that should be clear to everyone don't you think the federal reserve bank and the u.s treasury the u.s government also has a math problem coming here in 2023 with interest payments on the debt so if the fed does keep hiking interest rates there's a lot of u.s treasury debt that the national debt still rapidly growing i think we're almost at 32 trillion there's a lot there's trillions of dollars in u.s treasury bonds mark that need to be they're never going to be paid off they need to be rolled over though and they're going to have to be rolled over at higher rates at some point the interest payments on the national debt we're headed towards a trillion dollars per year just in interest payments it's the the math is just nuts yes you're right uh, there are problems all around. But I'd just like to say this. Uh, if you manage inflation like they do in uh, Turkey, we have 80% inflation. And what happened to the stock market in 2022? It almost doubled in US dollars, almost doubled. Have some Turkish stocks, they more than doubled. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you if you manage inflation, you can continue to do it for a while until the system collapses. So the people in Turkey didn't get wealthier, right? Because the inflation rate was so high. So actually the inflation rate, the stock market, even though the stock market was going up, they didn't get wealthier because similar things have happened, correct me if I'm wrong, in Zimbabwe and Venezuela in the past two, where their stock markets rose in nominal value, but the people became poor because they didn't own stocks or the stocks didn't keep up with the real inflation rate. Correct. The majority of people suffer. But uh, some people do quite well, the wealthy, because they they understand the foreign exchange mechanism and they have assets. So the assets say, 
a property in Istanbul is essentially valued in US dollars. It's not valued in local currencies. But if you go to the market and you buy fruits or you buy bread or whatever, it's valued in local currency. And that goes up uh, dramatically, probably more than wages. But, it can, but that, what I want to say is, of course, I am under any circumstance always in favor of tight monetary policies. I am against debts. Uh, I think people should save. And once they have enough savings, they should buy things. I'm not in favor of borrowing money to buy something uh, today which you could have saved for and bought in a year's time. You understand? So I'm in favor of tight monetary policies. I just want to say, uh, when you print money, the, uh, the money printing can last for quite some time until it the system collapses. Well, look at Japan. Isn't Japan one of the best examples of this? Because they've done yield curve control. They've kept their banks as zombie banks for almost 30 years now. They've done yield curve control, grown their national debt. They had their uh, citizens and pension funds buy enormous amounts of Japanese government bonds at artificially low interest rates. But the Bank of Japan, Mark, seems to finally be hitting the wall because they're trying to do yield curve control and they ha keep having to buy more bonds to try to cap interest rates. <laughs> yes. The Japanese, it will be an interesting uh, scenario to watch unfold in future. I mean, I'm 76 years old. I hope that I live another few years so I can see how this all comes to an end. This craziness of a world run by some bureaucrats that call themselves central bankers that haven't read history, they haven't even studied the classical economists properly, they just have some models and some idea that were given to them by the Fed and the World Economic Forum. They're all mad professors. And uh, that these people are basically running the world. <laughs> I mean, you have to laugh about this whole scenario. Uh, yeah, these it. are woke, woke central bankers, uh, academics, without having ever worked in their lives for a single day. None of them has worked in a, any business. The academics that uh, think they can uh, guide the world, they are interventionists. That's the word word they're interventionists who think they can plan the world's economy and their national economies and everything yeah hike called it fa hike called it the fatal conceit of the central planners that they're drastically overconfident and then they have to keep doing more and more manipulations and interventions and pulling more levers actually didn't Keynes say when he wrote his general theory he said it would work best with a totalitarian government yes now, I'm not sure that Jerome Powell is overconfident. That I'm not sure. When I look at him, uh, I find him rather insecure. But uh, I don't believe that he's independent. I think he gets his marching orders from other people, and he just executes uh, what he's told to do. That would be my impression. Yeah, I agree. The large U.S. banks, the money center banks like J.P. Morgan, then also like Larry Fink at BlackRock, because they've been having a lot of conference calls lately. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark, historically, I know you've studied a lot of financial history. You've read the history of interest rates. What normally happens with governments who have too much government debt? It, are we looking at a lot of government debt crises and currency problems over the next two or three years. And it's not just with the U.S., with all these governments. Correct. That's uh, uh, an appropriate description of the uh, 
that things that are coming. There's a lot of volatility that is going to happen in uh, the foreign exchange markets and in asset markets, in commodity markets, and so forth. So investors, they have uh, a lot of options. Some people will make a lot of money. You know, it's like a lottery. Uh, every time there's a lottery, someone wins big and the majority loses money. <laughs> and if someone wins by accident, which can happen in a thousand years or a million years, he can maybe win the lottery three times in a row or twice in a row. And then he can write a book, how I won the lottery and I have a system and this and that. And of course, it doesn't work for other people because it was coincidence. But in theory, I was just reading about the Stone Ages. <laughs> you know, we are in our written history, in our documented history, maybe 5,000 years old. Humans are millions of years old. There were humans three million years ago. So we're in a very small uh, phase of humanity at the present time. And I'm not even sure it will last very long. If you look at the, the governments and their warlike behavior, uh, who knows? We have now, for the first time in history, uh, the power to destroy ourselves. Earlier civilizations like the Neanderthal, they were destroyed by volcanic eruptions that were huge and changed the climate and so forth, the dinosaurs as well and so forth. But we now have the power to destroy ourselves. <laughs> Well, also up until the crypto bus, you had a lot of young adults, millennials, and other people that were piling into these meme stocks that were gambling on stock options. They didn't even know any basic fundamental trading. They were just looking at a chart and stocks were going up, crypto was going up. And so you just had people who knew nothing about investing or trading and they were making lots and lots of money temporarily. I don't know if they sold out or they kept their cash at FTX. <laughs> But for 12 to 18 months. I have months, never met. Well, I was running in Hong Kong two brokerage firms for 20 years. First, White Wealth, 1973 to 1978. Uh, uh, and then Drexel, 78 to 1990. Okay. Then I had my own business. In those days, uh, there was no internet and so forth. And so people came in. We have a 12 hours time difference between Hong Kong and New York. People came in at night. We had the trading room and the guest room. And the guests were there to trade all the time uh, London gold and silver. So they came in at night. And I can tell you, in the 20 years I've been running these brokerage firms, I have not met one, not one, who made money trading in and out. Not one. The stock market, any market, is a mechanism to distribute uh, accumulated savings of poor people and channel them to wealthy people. That's the purpose of the stock market. That's interesting. I mean, like the old business model for raising capital with an IPO used to be a company would go public so they could actually take the capital and invest in new factories, property plant equipment, property plant equipment, hire employees, uh, grow the company. But uh, really, since Silicon Valley started what with the uh, tech bubble, the goal was just to cash out, right, and dump the shares at the high onto retail investors. And I think we've seen a lot of that. And hopefully that will end soon. But it's uh, the, the last bubble, the last, the, it looks like we have tech bubbles bursting in China and Silicon Valley. Yes, I mean, you point out something rightly that the capital market is a mechanism to raise money. But it's interesting, recently, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world 
the founder of Home Depot, Bernie Marcus, I met him once at an interview. He's a very nice man, very humble, very simple. He gave a, a speech or an interview or wrote, I'm not 100% sure what, but he said, uh, the problem today of America is that socialism is destroying the entrepreneur uh, attitude or mentality of the young capitalists who want to work. Uh, socialism is making people lazy and comfortable and uh, makes them into uh, victims of everything. Everything is, uh, they are victims of everything. And, uh, but he is then shot down by the media. <laughs> He's an ultra right or ultra conservative guy. When he expresses himself exactly what it takes to be successful. I remember when I was with him on TV, he described how he started Home Depot and then they had some problems. And then they were working until 12 or two o'clock in the morning at night and putting things on shelves. He, the founder of Home Depot, is a multi-billionaire today. He's a wonderful person in my view. But the Vogue society shoots him down because of his views. <laughs> Yeah, I heard a similar story from the founder of Whole Foods. He started with a few grocery stores in Texas, I believe. So it started off really small. That's how a lot of businesses started. But Mark, with the interest rates going up, do you expect then the U.S. real estate, so home prices, to, to start a big crash in the not-too-distant future if the Fed is either going to keep raising interest rates or they're going to stay at these levels? I think you touch on a very interesting subject. Because if you look at the wealth profile of people, uh, not of Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, but ordinary people, the bulk of their assets is in property, okay? Maybe 70, 80% of the average American or the typical American or what you call in economic terms, the median household is maybe in real estate. Real estate, real estate has been going up a lot. I mean, we had a bubble in 2000, between 2003 and 2007, and it collapsed. And I thought, I mean, I have to say, I thought real estate is over for a long time. I thought after the collapse, it was good value because I went to Atlanta, I saw houses. It uh, cost them maybe 70,000 US or 80,000 US to buy. After the collapse, they were selling for 20,000 or 15,000. So I had a friend, he bought these homes as this big black rock, by the way, and black stone. Anyway, uh, but that the bubble would then be magnified to the extent it's been through zero interest rates, uh, engineered by these genius academics at <laughs> the Federal Reserve. <laughs> you have to laugh. They created the biggest bubble ever in real estate. But whereas in 2007, 2000, uh, I mean, 2003 to 2007, not all the real estate market went ballistic, like Dallas didn't move much or Denver didn't move much. Now, it's universal all over the world. It's in Germany and in France and in England and in Canada and in Australia and so forth, especially in the Anglo-Saxon countries. Canada has the most magnificent <laughs> real estate bubble you could imagine. Yeah, I think they just banned foreigners investing in, in properties there. I think I, I think I just saw that come out in the last 24 hours that they are going to pass a new law and foreign investors won't be able to buy properties in Canada now. Well, I mean, we say, just look at Trudeau. I mean, you have to scratch your head. 
how can a complete idiot like Trudeau become the leader of any country in the world? It's hard to believe. But that's the case nowadays. You know, the, the, the elections, uh, I doubt they're honest. I believe in Stalin, who said, doesn't matter <laughs> who votes. What matters is who is counting the votes. That I believe in. Well, it's easier now, digital and computers and software and hacking, and it's easier for them to rig elections than even in the past, because now they don't have to bury the ballot boxes. <laughs> they stopped Well, them. I mean, I, I'm against, uh, you know, Plato, the Greek philosopher. He already warned uh, that only educated people could be uh, voting in a democracy. Otherwise, it becomes mob rule. And if you look at old Westerners, uh, Western movies, and I recommend your viewers or listeners to do that, it's interesting that the mob rule in small villages, I mean, towns in the West, in rising towns, uh, there was frequently mob rule where the mob suddenly went after someone that they accused that he committed the crime and so was frequently was innocent, but they lynch, lynched him. And it was very difficult for the government to come in and say, no, this is illegal. Uh, we, have, uh, we have lawyers and we have judges and before someone is executed or lynched, he must be convicted through a court system. People didn't believe in a court system. They said uh, that in the court they will be acquitted. <laughs> so far, so they just went out and lynched the guy right away. Yeah, in the Greek city states, I think that's what happened with Socrates, right? So, yes. <laughs> So if there is more yes, volatility. Absolutely. Uh, Socrates was killed by the mob, murdered by the mob. Yeah. So the American colonists, when they were founding the United States, so that's why they wanted property owners. So people had a stake in the votes and then they wouldn't vote by mob rule. They wouldn't vote themselves free things. They wouldn't redistribute wealth because then they were they would essentially be giving up a lot of their own wealth because they were um going to vote for higher taxes and their property was going to be taken away or taxed. You're right. This is exactly what happened uh, when the Constitution was drafted. The idea was not that everyone should vote. No, the idea only educated people should vote. And uh, that uh, the property rights uh, should be respected because the wealthy people were the ones that owned the properties. So the constitution was written not to protect minorities like the Mexicans or the Turks or the blacks or whoever it was. It was to protect the rich people that owned the land. They were the minority. So, Mark, I want to transition to bailouts now. Do you think then that uh, we we just had over a couple months ago, we had the British government intervene with UK pension funds. They were doing some sophisticated leverage trades with bonds, the rising interest rates with the Bank of England, almost bankrupted pension <laughs> funds in 24 hours. I think the Federal Reserve Bank even had to give the Bank of England about $600 billion in emergency loans. Do you think that this is the new normal with pension fund bailouts? Well, Biden, he bailed out... I think the truckers' pension fund already. I think the pension funds, after the year of losses in 2022, and I'd like to point out an important factor. In all the bear markets in stocks, I witnessed personally, starting with the 73, 74 bear market. have been accompanied by rising bond prices. In other words, 
by declining interest rates. This was the case in 73, 74, in that recession, then in 81, 82, then in uh, the early uh, 1990s recession, also in the crash of 87, after the crash, bond, uh, yields fe- uh, bond yield fell. And then in 2000 uh, to 2002, in that recession, and in 2007, 2008, uh, stocks collapsed in 2007, 2008, but bonds rose like a rocket. In other words, interest rates fell sharply. This time around, 2022, both stocks and bonds went down. Can you imagine what it does to the pension funds that expect every year to earn 7% uh, return? Well, they have re- they have large real estate exposure too. So if real estate goes, then the pension funds are even more screwed. Yes, but they don't. Ha- they have a lot of real estate, but less than stocks and bonds. And by the way, uh, you know the real estate market. Since you asked me before, has rolled over in some areas in San Francisco and so forth. Prices are down fifteen percent from the highs, and more to come. That's essentially the big concern about the economy is going to be the negative wealth impact of falling asset prices on people's ability to consume and uh, on capital spending. I mean, the other day, Micron Technology announced that uh, their earnings wouldn't be that great. <laughs> That's a force uh, that you can expect from every company in future. But they said that their capital spending plans uh, were reduced from 11 to $12 billion to 5 to $6 billion. In other words, they cut capital expenditure projections for 2023 by almost 50%. By almost 50%. And they're probably going to so fire think, employees too. So their costs are up and they're probably going to fire employees. Sounds like a lot of supply chain problems and stagflation. No, it's not stagflation. Stagflation is an economy that moves sideways amidst uh, rising prices. In other words, uh, the 70s were stagflation. The economy didn't... Uh, expand, the stock market went down in real terms, inflation adjusted between 1966 to 82, 18 years, it went down by 70% in real terms. Anyway, but what I'm envisioning in future is an economy that contracts recently uh, the labor departments of different countries produced the statistics that for the first time in modern history, real wages in the developed economies had gone down. In other words, you have an inflation rate of 8%, wages go up by 5%, and real wages drop by 3%. Are you calling this an expansion in the economy? In my book, no, it's a contraction. But the government and your viewers and listeners should get used to it. Whatever the government says is a lie. Nothing is true. The politicians are elected and the voters know that the politicians are lying. Yeah, so it's Soviet Union levels of economic propaganda with GDP and inflation and the jobs reports. Look at some of your representative now. Someone got elected to Santos character. He lied about just about everything. But he's not alone. He says rightly, well, Biden also lies. And Trump also lies. And Kerry also lied. And uh, Quayle also lied. And Bush lied anyway. Uh, All these characters are liars. They're pathological cases. Power hungry. Uh, They're completely undemocratic. 
And I live right outside of D.C. for over 20 years. So, I mean, not much changes with either party. I mean, the bureaucrats run a lot of the stuff The 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 politically elected people at the top of each agency change. But the policies, the underlings don't change at all. I mean, very few people get fired, even if they commit felonies or do a lot of other bad things. You're correct. These some of these organizations, the FBI and the CIA, people say, well, the government won the war against the mafia. No, they adopted the policies of the mafia in a much worse uh, dimension. The mafia was relatively honest compared to the bureaucrats that we have that run mafia-like organizations. So, Mark, who do you think is going to end up buying the U.S. Treasuries? Because I don't see D.C., either political party and the bureaucracy here, wanting to reduce spending. If they're going to keep with these fake economic data in the GDP, they're going to want to spend more, whether it's borrow and spend or tax and borrow and spend. So who's going to end up having to buy the U.S. Treasuries then? (laughs) I have to laugh because you're a very perceptive person. I mean, you should just give a speech yourself and not interview other people because you see things very clearly. Correct. We have a uniparty in Washington, D.C., as we have in different countries. Uh, Whether you vote for Democrats or Republicans, they will spend anyway. (laughs) There's no spending restraint. What happens when they go about the budget, they say to Democrats, okay, we let you do this, but in return, you have to let us do that and so forth. So the spending goes through the roof. And everybody knows that to increase taxation is difficult, so they hide tax increases and so forth. But the easiest tax increase Is inflation, people don't realize inflation is a tax. It's an unfair tax on the middle class and the lower classes and people that cannot cheat the government. You understand? But but what happens when you overtax is that people will begin to evade paying taxes. For the rich people, it's very easy to not to pay tax because to a large extent, they control who pays the tax. Well, here in the U.S., you also have like FAFSA. And now you have all these governments because people have evaded taxes by paying cash or not opening a bank account. They get paid off the books in cash. You have these governments talking about central bank digital currencies. Not only can they uh, ban their citizens from doing certain things, they can also immediately put all these different taxes on every single economic transaction digitally without even the taxpayer or Congress voting on it. Well, and they found now a perfect tax loophole, sending money to Ukraine and getting kickbacks. This is a wonderful machine and nobody will give it up because it's so profitable. I want to transition now and ask you about commodities and supply side problems. So do you think then that China is going to reopen, actually allow the economy to people in the private sector to actually start doing economic activities? And would that be good for demand for commodities then? Well, first of all, I have to make a remark. The reason I'm laughing is I think you're afraid that uh, you can't put my interview on YouTube. (laughs) <laughs> because they will censor it. But uh, concerning commodities, I think the Chinese economy and the global economy is already in recession. I wrote already three reports on the subject why it's in a recession already. Uh, not in recession necessarily for some of the rich people and so forth. But I can tell you, a lot of wealthy people have lost a lot of money in 2022. And in Europe, the wealthy people have lost so much money on everything that they will wake up politically 
And uh, I think a lot of uh, left movements or the movement to the left and to the Greens and also for may have peaked out. Anyway, but about the commodities, I think uh, most commodities have topped out for the time being. I'd like to explain what happened in the 70s. Inflation accelerated in the US mildly uh, in the late 50s and uh, steadily in the 60s, especially after the uh, guns and bread policies of Johnson. He increased government spending a lot uh, during the Vietnam War. And so inflation began to accelerate and it then uh, went up into 1970, then it came down somewhat, but then it went up strongly into 74. And then it came down again sharply into 77, okay? By 73, 74, the rate of inflation was around 12%, but then it fell again until to around 5%, but then it rose again after into 1980, 81. So my sense is that we are at the beginning of a major long-term inflationary trend and in a long-term uh, secular trend for interest rates to move up. Uh, interest rates move in long-term cycles. So we have a peak in interest rates in 29 and then a declining interest rate structures until 1942-43. And then from the Second World War onwards, we have a rising interest rate structure until 1980. And from 1980 until, 19, uh, until 2020, a falling interest rate structure uh, interrupted by counter moves. But m interest rates move in like long cycles, uh, sometimes called contratia. Uh, now, we are now, we have reached on the 10 years a low in interest rates at 0.57%, okay? In Europe, we had negative yields on long-term bonds. From here on, it's all upwards, but irregularly. And so I think that now we are in a rising trend in interest rates. In 2023, central banks will panic. And again, flush the system with liquidity. And then inflation will accelerate again. Now, if I look at the 70s, at the commodity cycle, commodities went up, but wheat, corn, soybeans peaked out in 1973. Coffee, cocoa in 77. Gold, silver, copper, 1980. So it's not that everything hit, hits the peak at, on the same day. The price of coffee has nothing to do with the price of gold. And the price of wheat has very little to do with the price of copper. It, they move in general in the same direction, but the peaks and troughs are not on the same day. You also back then didn't have uh, oil and natural gas drilling bans in a lot of landmass, especially European Union, which consumes an enormous amount of energy. And then you didn't have these ESG policies, which are misallocating capital on the hundreds of billions or trillions of dollar scale, preventing all these energy investments. And that's why you have all these energy crises all over the world with a uh, lack of cheap electricity from either coal or natural gas or liquefied natural gas, just bad central planning and energy policies. Correct. Societies are not conquered by foreign forces. Putin is a minor enemy. The major enemy are completely irrational uh, 
the uncommon sense of some fanatics, zealots that don't understand anything about climate, but they claim that they understand. They don't understand anything about vaccines or medicine, but they're suddenly experts. And these people will destroy our society. I guarantee you. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense for Germany to have uh, to rely on solar power because they're not uh, they don't have the best sunlight every year and they have bad weather. It's a pipe dream to think that you can uh, provide an electricity in an environmental friendly way with windmills. It's crazy. Well, they use tons of these are the windmills of Don Quixote. They use tons of rare earth elements too, and the Chinese have basically a monopoly on those. So they're not, and rare earth mining isn't environmentally friendly either. It's, I tell you, a lot of these policies by the ESG people is madness. It's corruption. It's cr- they're crooks. It's a very good book. Let me see whether I can find it. Uh, <laughs> Here. Can you read Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds? This is about the major manias in the world. <laughs> it was written at the beginning yeah, of I've the been... 19th century it's by a great Charles book. McKay. Yeah. And he talks about the tulip bubbles and the alchemists and the crusades, all these mad enterprises. History books will write about our ESG policies. But you understand, the Black Rocks and these people, they endorse them. Yeah, I view ESG as a scam. So it's a spending scam for money to be siphoned off or stolen or filtered to extra spending or projects or friends and family members who are on boards of directors for these uh, biofuels or wind or solar companies. I need another drink after this <laughs> interview. It's, it's not quite happy hour here yet. Uh, <laughs> so, and I'm also hung over from New Year's from New Year's from the party. So Mark, uh, as we wrap up here, I have a few more questions. So then it's probably not, you think there's going to be a lot of volatility in commodities prices. Do you think there's still a global food and energy crisis and that there's a lack of um, investment then on the supply side for a lot of these commodities going forward? Yes, but you understand for the next six months or so, the economy will, uh, in my opinion, disappoint. And the media, which is an accomplice, I mean, the media people are the most horrible people you can imagine. In combination with the government, they actually encourage the lies that the government are broadcasting. And there's very critical, uh, very little critical opinion by the media that they may be critical about some issues you know about the muslims or the teachings of well, buddha or the irrelevant things used to but be on business they, television they never truly attack the government well used to be on business television all the time but now if you you can't criticize the federal reserve bank at all for any of their bad policies or the or the producers will say that you can't go back on tv Happened to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look at the cl- look at that. It happened to me. Yeah, look at the clown uh, because- Jim Kramer that they have on all the time. <laughs> she even has like all the clown sounds and stuff on her show. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but uh, the, the the point is, I think uh, individuals they have to think the whole thing through. In my view. Further money printing in future is inevitable. You raise the point about the government debt and as interest rates go up that they have to pay more and more. So they will have to print more and more, in my view. 
This or, is what financial history says, right? I mean, like <laughs> the governments don't want to have to default. Uh, they can default, but it may be very costly to default. So uh, they will say, well, what is the option that causes the least pain? And that's money printing. Number two, as an individual, you have to look at the world. Today, the US has an arsenal that is probably still superior to other arsenals in the world, like the Chinese or the Russians and so forth. But do they have the software to run this arsenal? In other words, do they, the, the Vogue army nowadays, uh, is it capable to fight a war like the Americans fought during World War II? That I doubt. That I doubt. Well, I think there's been I a lot doubt of- that today's generation will run up the hills of Iwo Jima and fight man against man against the Japanese. That yeah. I doubt. Yeah, I mean, they're using drones and they're using other automated. I think there's a lot of financial warfare, Mark. I think there's a lot of market manipulations and financial warfare hacking and stuff by different governments. Their military. Yeah, yeah, sure. Anyway, uh, but I think individuals should consider that with the relative decline of the U.S. I mean, the U.S. was the dominant economy in the 50s and 60s. Since then, it's no longer the dominant economy because markets in India and China, I mean, China has 1.3 billion people, India has 1.3 billion people, are so large. Indonesia has over 200 million people, Bangladesh the same, Pakistan and so forth. I mean, we have a world that is very large, that has grown a lot in the last 50 years since the breakdown of communism and uh, socialism ideology. And uh, the, the, the center of gravity of the global economy is no longer the US, but has shifted to Asia. And this creates a lot of problems. But for a US investor, I would say, he needs to diversify outside the Anglo-Saxon axis of the UK, the US, Canada, and Australia. He needs to have some money elsewhere. And he needs to have some money in precious metals. Although my concern is if, if the governments of Trudeau could lock up people because they supported the truck strikers and so forth, yeah. he can one day say, okay, we're going to collect all the gold. Well, a lot of people instead abandoned gold and silver and gold stocks and went to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, but then they stupidly kept the money, uh, their crypto at the exchanges like FTX. They didn't take their uh, their crypto off off the exchanges, So, and then they got defrauded. Well, I mean, I, I'd just like to say something. If you look at uh, this character at uh, FTX and then his girlfriend, you have to question the sanity of people who would deal with them, who would even consider an investment with them. It sounds like they bribed a lot of celebrities, uh, a lot of professional athletes and celebrities to market for them. So that fooled a lot of people. So they paid off like all the all the famous talking heads, uh, these athletes and celebrities to do the to do the endorsements. Correct. But why does this happen? It happens in an environment where central banks print money. The printing of money has enormous negative social consequences and it uh, encourages fraud and dishonest behavior. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. And also, and <laughs> right, also you understand, yeah. as long as money printing produces rising asset prices, Wall Street applauds the money printing. And Silicon Valley does accounting fraud too. Yeah. Increases the net asset value of funds and of the fees Wall Street gets. 
Yep. And then people don't I'm focus on fundamentals. I'm a product of this asset inflation. I benefited from asset inflation. I'm not denying that. But as an economist, I am completely against money printing under any circumstances, any circumstance. Yeah, but historically, Mark, you know, and you've studied this, is the easy way out because it's the dishonest inflation, um, monetizing debt, debasing the currency. It's the the slower route that most people, as Kane said, one in a million people do not recognize, and only one in a million people recognize inflation. I just butchered the quote, but most well, people I'm don't glad recognize. You studied Keynes and the fallacies that he broadcasted. Oh yeah, I'm not a fan of Keynes at all. <laughs> Yeah, F.A. Well, Hayek, I, F. I, F. Hayek and Mises, yeah. I have a high regard for Keynes. He was a very intelligent man, not a nice man, arrogant, but he was very intelligent. Oh, yeah, he and understood. And he wrote the book that became very important in the economic literature. If you ask me who are the five or ten most important economists, I would say Keynes is one of them. Yeah. Marx is another one of them. Uh, both are wrong, but both are uh, recognized and highly read. <laughs> yeah, Keynes uh, under Keynes understood human psychology. I mean, he was also a speculator and he traded on inside information in his government jobs. <laughs> well, Mark, I really enjoyed our discussion. He had a disastrous performance. He had a disastrous performance. He went but yeah, he went bankrupt once or twice, but then he also I think he uh, he left like millions of dollars um when he died. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But he was trading on inside information, though. I mean, like I read a couple of his biographies. He was trading on inside information from the government. Well, Mark, I want to thank you so much for your time today. If my listeners want to check out your newsletter, how did they do so? Well, I'm not sure they want to check out, but they can go <laughs> to the website, gloomboomdoom.com. All in one word, gloomboomdoom. <laughs>